Welcome to the Human Health Campus Basic Nuclear Medicine Webinar Series. This webinar is entitled Introduction to Nuclear Medicine in Neurology, Basis for Clinical Use, and is presented by Silvia Morbelli from the Nuclear Medicine Unit, IRCCS San Martino, IST, University of Genoa, Italy. I am pleased to present this seminar to you on behalf of the Nuclear Medicine and Diagnostic Imaging Section of the International Atomic Energy Agency in collaboration with the European Association of Nuclear Medicine. To this aim, we will first have an overview of Tracer for central nervous system imaging, then we will discuss different neurological disorders, including neurodegenerative dementia, Parkinsonian syndromes, epilepsy, and brain tumors. And for each one of these disorders, we will first focus on pathophysiological and clinical background for nuclear medicine imaging, tracer distribution and diagnostic contribution, and we will finally focus on demonstrative cases with questions and answers. In this slide, you can see the most important characteristics of PET and SPECT tracers for brain imaging. These features include ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, not being a P-glycoprotein substrate, having high affinity and selectivity for the target, having suitable pharmacokinetics in terms of observed uptake and washout, a favorable dosimetry and lacking radioactive metabolites that also cross the blood-brain barrier. Targets for clinical nuclear medicine imaging in neurology include brain perfusion and metabolism, receptor and thus neurotransmission imaging, transporter imaging also including amino acid transporter imaging. A general index of neural integrity and function can be obtained by taking advantage of neuron glial metabolic coupling. In fact, the high energy demands of neuronal synaptic activity are met by the provision of lactate through glial cells, leading to increased glucose consumption in these cells. FDG PET has the unique ability to estimate the local cerebral metabolic rate of glucose consumption, thus providing information on the distribution of neuronal deaths and synapse dysfunction in vivo. And when FDG PET is performed at rest, glucoptic distribution is driven mainly by basal neuronal glutamatergic activity. Thus, glucose metabolism has been shown to be closely coupled to neuronal function and, as glucose consumption is coupled with oxygen consumption, oxygen availability and thus regional cerebral blood flow is coupled with the glucose consumption. For this reason, both brain metabolism as evaluated by means of FTG PET and brain perfusion routinely evaluated by means of perfusion SPECT are widely used when neuronal integrity and or function need to be evaluated as in case of neurodegenerative diseases or epilepsy. So, as both PET and SPECT can be used for these purposes and SPECT has lower costs with respect to PET, it is worthwhile to ask if PET is technically better than SPECT in clinical neurology. And actually, the answer is yes. In fact, the collimator in gamma camera is a lead or tanks which rejects many photons that do not propagate along the axis at right angles in order to make sure that the origin of emission scan can be discerned. The disadvantage of this is that collimators absorb most of the photons, resulting in the fact that the sensitivity of SPECT is several order of magnitude lower than that one of PET. Furthermore, the spatial resolution of SPECT is dependent on the collimation, collimation errors, which are lower with respect to PET. So, the spatial resolution of uh, SPECT is uh, about uh, 8 to 10 mm, while the resolution of SPECT is about 3 to 5 mm, and thus PET is better than SPECT in clinical neurology. Let's review now perfusion SPEC procedures according to ENM guidelines. Prior to the investigation, the patient should avoid the excessive stimulants and it might be necessary to discuss drug withdrawal with the clinician caring for the patient. 
patient history with particular focus on neurological and psychiatric disorders need to be collected, as well as information about surgery, radiation or trauma to the brain. Information about morphological and functional imaging studies need also to be collected. Then the patient needs to be placed in a quiet, dimly lit room with an intravenous cannula in a comfortable position and the patient needs to be instructed to keep the eyes open and not to move at least 5 minutes before and 5 minutes after the injection. Any event that might uh, influence cerebral blood flow during drug delivery needs to be carefully recorded and it is advisable to maintain the same environment for all perfusion study in the same center. Typical administered dose is around 740 megabecquerel, uh, while for pediatric patients, uh, ENM dosage CAR table need to be checked. We should try always to keep the same time delay from injection to start or date acquisition, which is typically between 30 to 60 minutes for ECD and 30 to 90 minutes for uh, HMPO. Then images need to be um, acquired on a multi detective camera and reconstructed uh, uh, with the attenuation correction always recommended, typically by using an homogeneous collection matrix according to Chang. Let's review now FDG PET procedures. As in the case of SPECT, information about medical history and administered drugs need to be collected. Patient should fast in this case for at least 4 hours to allow optimal cerebral FTG uptake not influenced by increased serum glucose level. Thus, blood glucose level should be checked prior to FTG administration. Actually, in brain tumors, hyperglycemia does not need to be corrected and can even enhance detectability. Patient should be then positioned comfortably in a quiet dim lit room with an intravenous cannula several minutes before FTG administration and during the uptake phase of FTG, which is at least 20 minutes. Recommended activity is around 150 megabecquerel for 3D mode and again children ENM dosage card need to be checked. Images must be acquired uh, at least 30 minutes after the injection. Receptor neurotransmission imaging is possible by means of SPECT and PET thanks to their extremely high sensitivity. High affinity for the targets does allow in imaging of regions with low density of receptors. Different pathways can be investigated both on the presynaptic and postsynaptic sides, including receptor transporters and enzyme uh, imaging. Finally, by evaluating amino acid uptake imaging, brain tumors can be investigated. The uptake mechanism is based on the fact that glial tumors overexpress the L-type amino acid transporters. This type of imaging takes also advantage on the fact that low uptake is present in normal brain tissue, as we will see later on. Several labeled amino acid analogs can be used for brain tumor imaging. Natural amino acids include carbon-11 methionine, uh, which, due to the short half-life of carbon-11, can be used for PET only in center with an inside cyclotron. However, other amino acid analogs, such as fat and fluorodopa, can be also performed, uh, can be also used to perform the brain imaging with PET in site without an on-site cyclotron, thanks to the label and to with fluorine 19. Let's review now the main clinical indications for nuclear medicine imaging. We will first focus on neurodegenerative dementia. Clinical scenario has changed in the last year and nuclear medicine procedures are, are not used an, uh, anymore only for the identification of different patterns of neurodegenerative dementia in already demented patients and thus in patients where cognitive impairment is also parallel by impact on daily functioning. But we need now also to help the clinician in the identification of uh, neurodegenerative dementia when the patient is still at the stage of mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment refers to the more subtle cognitive impairment 
without uh, impairment in daily functioning. And MCI patients are a, a heterogeneous group of patients, including a 50% of patients who will clinically convert to Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative dementia, and another 50% will remain stable over time, maybe as uh, uh, the um, source of MCI is just, uh, for example, the presence of depression. I would like to start with the description of a normal FDG PET scan uh, because we need to uh, learn how to recognize a normal pattern on FDG PET. As you know, high rate of physiologic glucose metabolism is present in normal gray matter with the highest value in basal ganglia, occipital, poral and mesial cortex while the medial temporal cortex and the cerebellum have the lowest value. To uh, better evaluate uh, imaging for the segmentation of different brain parts as well as for the evaluation of asymmetry, it is important to reorient images along the bicomissural line in sagittal view and specifically also to reorient imaging in the coronal view to be sure that homologous structures appear at the same time and thus uh, to evaluate the presence of asymmetries. By contrast, uh, the typical hypometabolic pattern in MCI due to AD, as in Alzheimer's disease, it is characterized by temporal parietal and posterior cingulate cortex, more variably or anyway later in the frontal cortex, um, and uh, a relative preservation of sensory motor and visual cortex and cerebellum. However, and even in voxel-based group analysis, the more prominent area of hypometabolism uh, in Alzheimer's disease patients is, the is uh, uh, at uh, pa posterior parietal and posterior cingulate and brachyoneus level with the temporal lateral uh, hypometabolism and with the less evident and consistent uh, presence of medial temporal lobe hypometabolism, which is actually surprising as we know that the disease starts at hippocampal level and in the intonical cortex. And this is even more surprising if we consider that MRI, the other neurodegenerative biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, is able to capture, first of all, the presence of hippocampal atrophy. And so there's a topographical mismatch with respect to FTG PET. The reason for this topographical mismatch between MRI and FTG PET is related to the deep meaning of the signals evaluated by means of MRI and FTG PET. In fact, while MRI highlights the presence of atrophy, which is the ultimate sign of neural death and neural loss, brain glucose consumption, as you know, maximally occurs at synaptic level and does reflect synaptic activity. And this is relevant for uh, Alzheimer's disease as we know that lung axons from the hippocampus connect at parietal uh, posterior cortex and posterior cingulate level. And so that posterior hypometabolism correspond to a disconnection from the hippocampus. And this is relevant for Alzheimer's disease and for other neurodegenerative diseases as it has been demonstrated from neuropathological studies that in Alzheimer's disease synaptic degeneration generation precedes neuronal deaths for a substantial period of time. That's why FDG PET precedes MRI in the cascade of positivization of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And these pathophysiological concepts, concepts are also relevant for our daily clinical practice. In fact, a reduced uptake on FDG PET or perfusion SPECT uh, corresponds to different underlying pathophysiological scenarios. As in the first case, we have, uh, a at we have atrophy on MRI and thus uh, the hypometabolism highlighted on FDG PET is just due to the fact that in presence of arteries there are no elements able to trap FDG. In the second example, reduced uh, brain glucose consumption is due to the reduction of local synapses due to reduction of cortical cortical neurons. As you can see here, we have mild atrophy in the uh, left temporolateral cortex. By contrast, all the um, 
uh, left temporal uh, hemisphere is characterized by um, marked and uh, extensive uh, hypometabolism due to the reduction of corticocortical neurons. And finally, reduced glucose uh, consumption can be due to reduction of distant synapses, uh, as we have just said, in case of the affrontation of diaschesis. In this case, we have atrophy at hippocampal level and thus hypoperfusion, while uh, uh, there's no much atrophy in posterior parietal cortex, but we have marked hypoperfusion due to the disconnection from the hippocampus. Let's review now two demonstrative cases. These are two MCI patients, both male, 70 years old. They were both complaining of memory impairment, which was actually objectivized due to a neuropsychological battery. Everything was normal except for a mild impairment in episodic memory. Which of these sentences best describe uh, FDG PET results? A. Both FDG PET are suggestive of MCI due to AD and show AD typical pattern. B. Only scan A is suggestive for MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. C. Only scan B is suggestive of MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. D. Both scans are negative for Alzheimer's disease with a mild area of hypometabolism likely due to underlying brain vascular disease. The correct answer is C. Only scan B is suggestive of MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. So, the AD pattern was clearly present in patient B and in this case the pattern included a clear asymmetry, also a medial temporal lobe level. However, if we look back to the uh, entity of uptake in medial temporal cortex even in the patients with a normal scan, we cannot avoid to know that the uptake is not so high even in a normal uh, FDG PET scan and thus it might be more difficult to assess the presence of asymmetry when uh, the uh, extension of hypometabolic pattern is less evident. There are, however, tips to uh, better recognize the presence of this asymmetry. One of them is to reorient twice the imaging, the images, uh, not only along the micomissural line, but also uh, following the so-called Onishi reorientation along the hippocampal axis, which is 30 degree upward with the nose upward with respect to the micomissural line. And in this way, the hippocampus will be included within one or two slices and the presence of asymmetries will be more clearly evaluated. Similarly, a visual evaluation or in a coronal view can be helpful to assess the presence of asymmetry. In fact, even with MRI, the evaluation of the so-called scanter scale is performed in coronal view. So, visual analysis can allow the identification of disease pattern on FDG PET. However, it is advisable to support visual reading with objective software-based analysis, and this especially for moderately skilled readers. However, as already mentioned, FDG PET and hippocampal volumetries assessed by structural MRI are just two of the proposed biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease at the stage of MCI. In recent years, amyloidosis biomarkers has become available. In fact, brain amyloidosis can be assessed by means of CSS biochemical analysis and more recently by means of amyloid PET. Let's discuss now the basis of amyloid PET imaging in Alzheimer's disease and in the differential diagnosis of neurodegenerative dementia. The first developed and most studied tracers for brain uh, amyloid PET imaging is the, the so-called Pittsburgh Compound B labeled with carboline level. Uh, Pittsburgh Compound B as well as all the new uh, fluorinated tracers for amyloid PET imaging uh, are characterized by high affinity to amyloid parallel by a favorable uh, quick washout from normal gray matter. However, this high affinity is also parallel by limited specificity to amyloid type. In fact, PAB and fluorinated tracer for brain uh, amyloid PET uh, are able to label 
classic neuritic plaques, which are typical of Alzheimer's disease, but also diffuse extracellular plaques not specific for Alzheimer's disease and vascular amyloid cerebral angiopathy, as you can see here. So, PIB, as well as all the new available fluorinated tracers for amyloid PET imaging, are able to bind uh, an area characterized by uh, the presence of amyloid load, but they do not significantly bind both tau pathology and alpha seq nuclein. This was actually a mandatory feature, however, it was not obvious at as uh, uh, another tracer actually developed before PIB, FDDNP, uh, was uh, uh, actually uh, able to bind not only to uh, amyloid deposit but also to neurofibrillar rectangle and thus it is not used anymore as an uh, amyloid PET diagnostic tracer as its distribution complicates images interpretation. Negative predictive value is certainly today one of the most relevant and powerful features of amyloid PET. As in this case, among these two MCI patients, the patients on the left with this negative amyloid PET is very unlikely to show the clinical features of Alzheimer's disease in the next few years, and obviously the patients on the right with a positive amyloid PET is more likely to clinically convert to Alzheimer's disease in the next few years. However, I would like to underline that the extremely high negative predictive value of amyloid PET is powered by a lower positive predictive value which is influenced by patient's age and ApoE genotype status. The three fluorinated tracers for amyloid PET imaging, they all are derivative of compounds used for immunohistochemical staining of amyloid PET of amyloid in vitro. They have been validated by means of visual analysis and autoptical studies showing that visual analysis can provide binary information on the presence or absence of amyloid load in the brain. As you can see, the typical features on the left of a negative scans are a, pre a presence of uh, high, uh, a specific uptake in the white matter surrounded by a lower uptake in the gray matter, while the features of positive scan on the right correspond to a loss of contrast between uh, gray and white matter, as well as even higher uptake in uh, the gray matter with respect to the adjacent white matter. So, visual analysis has been demonstrated to provide consistent information, however, quantification and several quantitative approaches are under evaluation and they will be probably more able to capture the complexity of this disease. Guidelines and appropriate use criteria for amyloid PET has been proposed. Uh, and uh, the appropriate use of amyloid PET is suggested in case of persistent or progressive unexplained memory loss, unusual clinical presentation and a typical early age of onset before the age of 65. Amyloid PET can be used to support the differential diagnosis between Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. Generally, this differential diagnosis is a clinical differential diagnosis, as in classical presentation, FDD has different clinical features with respect to Alzheimer's disease. The cognitive impairment includes other domains, such as executive function and language, and there's presence of behavioral symptoms, such as disinhibition or apathy. However, there might be a um, a typical variant and in these more doubtful cases amyloid PET can help to perform the differential diagnosis as FTD is negative for brain amyloidosis. Let's review now a demonstrative case uh, uh, by taking advantage of both FDG PET and amyloid PET. This is a female with a multi-domain amnestic MCI showing a mild impairment in episodic memory, executive function and phonological verbal fluency and showing apathy and history of depression. FDG PET was performed for the suspicions of underlying neurodegenerative etiology and for the differential diagnosis between Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. Which pattern of hypometabolism do you recognize in this brain FDG PET? A. 
Bilateral temporal parietal AD like pattern with preserved frontal metabolism, B. Normal scan, C. Left frontal temporal and parietal regions are all moderately hypometabolic, D. Hypometabolism in the basal ganglia. The correct answer is C. Left frontal, temporal and parietal regions are all moderately hypometabolic. So the highlighted, highlighted pattern was actually not clearly able to support a differential diagnosis between Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. So, to further support the differential diagnosis between Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia, the patient was submitted to an amyloid PET performed in the concept of a clinical trial. How do you classify this amyloid PET scan? A. Positive, B. Negative, C. Inconclusive. The correct answer is A. The scan is positive and, given the age of these patients, a positive amyloid PET scan clearly supports the diagnosis of MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. Let's discuss now the role of nuclear medicine in Parkinsonian syndromes. The assessment of the dopaminergic system in Parkinsonian syndromes is important as it is important to establish the diagnosis as Parkinsonism is a feature of several diseases and the differential uh, diagnosis of Parkinsonian syndromes is of importance because these diseases have different treatment strategies, different response to therapy and different prognosis. And we want to perform functional images as there are difficulties to reliably establish the diagnosis clinically, uh, as shown in post-mortem studies, and the structural imaging is often inconclusive or anyway positive only in late stage of disease, while the assessment of dopaminergic system by means of SPECT or PET is a specific approach to address the pathology of the nigrostriatal dopaminergic system also in the preclinical phase of some of these diseases. In this schematic representation, you can see both presynaptic and postsynaptic radio tracer for dopaminergic system imaging. Given the basic and the clinical nature of this webinar, we will more deeply focus on the presynaptic dopaminergic imaging. So, let's first review clinical and neuropathological features of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is the most frequent source of neurodegenerative Parkinsonism. From the clinical point of view, it's characterized by rigidity, akinesia, tremor, and postural instability. The diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, two of the major symptoms need to be present, and akinesia needs to be one of them. In this schematic representation, you can see the negro striatal pathway both in a normal subject and in a subject with Parkinson's disease, the reduction of melanin uh, pigmentation that uh, uh, black dots correspond to the reduction of dopaminergic neurons, which more markedly affect the negro uh, putaminal pathway, while uh, the connection with the caudatus are uh, less involved or anyway later on in the course of the disease. From the neuropathological point of view, the disease is characterized by the presence of lebibotic, which are um, intraneuronal aggregates of alpha C nuclein together with ubiquitin. By contrast, this immunohistochemical staining represents the loss of dopamine transporter, which is severe since the early stage of disease with respect to controls and follows the course of the disease uh, from uh, the uh, early stages to late stages, which is uh, relevant for us as, as you know, dopamine transporters can be used for uh, uh, diagnostic purposes. So, dopamine transporters is able to take out dopamine from the synaptic cleft, and the imaging of dopamine transporters can be obtained by means of FPC spect 
FPC is an analog of cocaine with a high affinity and good specificity for that, and specific to non-specific ratios are stable between 3 to 6 hours, both in controls and in uh, Parkinson's disease patients. That's why we acquire images between 3 to 6 hours after injection. So, the normal distribution of that spect uh, it is characterized by the symmetrical high uptake in the basal ganglia. However, uh, there's loss of dopaminergic neurons uh, with aging and thus there's an aging effect. We can have a mild reduction in striatal uptake with age, which uh, uh, affect all the striatum but can be relatively more prominent at caudatus level, thus showing a pattern different from what evident in uh, Parkinson's disease. That's why ENM procedure guidelines for that spect allow visual interpretation but suggest the use of semi-quantitative evaluation which can be performed by means of a region of interest technique as well as by uh, specific so softwares. In general, specific binding ratio with respect to occipital cortex or cerebellum can be computed and age and gender matched nodes need to be used. Uh, and if external norms are used, calibration for different camera is needed. Different commercially available or freeware softwares are uh, actually uh, available. Pattern of reduced uptake in that spect in patients with idiopathic Parkinson disease, it is characterized by the presence of uh, reduced uptake, first of all, in the putamen contralateral to the most affected body side. Later on, the contralateral putamen is also involved, then the caudatus in the most affected hemisphere, and so on. The reduction of uptake follows the course of the disease. That spect can be used to support the differential diagnosis with essential tremor and non neurodegenerative Parkinson's, including symptomatic Parkinson's such as psychogenic and drug induced Parkinson's, as well as pseudo Parkinson's such as normal pressure, hydrocephalus, and vascular Parkinson's. In all these cases, uh, th that spect is normal. In vascular Parkinson's, we can have mild uh, reduction of uptake, however, never following the uh, typical uh, uh, pattern of uh, idiopathic Parkinson disease. That spect can be also used to support the differential diagnosis between dementia with levy body and Alzheimer's disease, as in dementia with levy body we have a positive scan, while the scan is normal in Alzheimer's disease. However, when the differential diagnosis of neurodegenerative Parkinsonism needs to be performed, this cannot be uh, evaluated at presynaptic level, as presynaptic side is damaged both in atypical Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease patients, while postsynaptic size is actually intact in Parkinson's disease patients, can be used for diagnostic purposes. So let's discuss now the use of other uh, nuclear medicine uh, imaging procedures in the differential diagnosis of neurodegenerative Parkinsonism. So historically, postsynaptic dopaminergic imaging has been proposed to perform the differential diagnosis between Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonism. D2 PET and D2 SPECT can actually perform this differential diagnosis. However, D2 PET with carbon 11 rock applied as well as D2 SPECT are not widely available. And for D2 SPECT, significant overlap between Parkinson's disease and MSA have been demonstrated. That's why other tracers have been proposed for the differential diagnosis between uh, neurodegenerative Parkinsonism and in this frame there's an emerging role of FTG PET. It has been demonstrated that FTG PET provides a high diagnostic accuracy higher with respect to D2 SPECT and it is able to reliably discriminate between all the diskins atypical uh, Parkinsonian syndromes and thus uh, FTG PET has been proposed clearly in this contest. 
in fact, each different uh, uh, neurodegenerative uh, Parkinsonism is characterized by a different uh, pattern of hypometabolism on FTG PET. Parkinson's disease is the only one characterized by a preserved or even hypermetabolic in the early stage of disease uptake in the basal ganglia. It is also characterized by hypometabolism in uh, temporolateral, posterior parietal and even frontal cortex. Multiple system atrophy is characterized by hypometabolism in basal ganglia and cerebellum according to the two subtypes of disease, MSAP and MSAC. Progressive supranuclear palsy is characterized by hypometabolism in the uh, anterior cingulate uh, frontolateral cortex, uh, basal ganglia thalamus and brainstem. Corticobasal degeneration is characterized by a markedly asymmetric hypometabolism involving uh, frontal, uh, temporal, parietal uh, cortex and basal ganglia in the hemisphere controlateral to the body side where uh, symptoms are most prominent and dementia with levy body characterized by a prominent hypometabolism more evident in parietal and especially occipital uh, cortical regions. Let's review now a demonstrative case on neurodegenerative Parkinsonism. Which neurodegenerative disease would you suggest according to that SPECT and FTG PET findings? A. Scan A is suggestive of uh, Levy body dementia or Parkinson disease. B. Scan B is suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. C. Scan C is suggestive of MSA. D. All previous answers are correct. correct. answer is D. All previous answers are correct. A further way to support the differential diagnosis within neurodegenerative Parkinsonism is by means of 123 MIVG cardiac imaging. This uh, imaging can also support the differential diagnosis between Alzheimer's disease and Levy body dementia. In fact, in Parkinson's disease, as well as in Levy body dementia, we have an, imper an impairment of uptake due to postganglionic damage, while a normal scan is present in both Alzheimer's disease and in uh, other atypical Parkinsonism. So, let's discuss now the role of PET transpect in epilepsy. Indications for nuclear medicine procedures in epilepsy includes the identification of seizure onset zone, especially in the so-called non-invasive phase of the presurgical evaluation. Uh, in particular, FTG PET is able to reduce the need for invasive procedures and to provide also optimal placement of subdural grids or deep electrodes. Different radiopharmaceuticals can be used for SPECT or PET imaging of epilepsy in clinical practice. Interictal imaging can be obtained both by means of FTG PET or perfusion SPECT, while only perfusion SPECT can be used for rectal imaging. In fact, SPECT imaging using uh, 99 metastable technician labeled co compounds such as HMPO and ACD provides information about cerebral blood flow and have been used to evaluate patients with epilepsy. In fact, it has been directly demonstrated that cortical blood flow significantly increases during a seizure and this tracer distributes in a few minutes to the brain and then their distribution is stable for some hours. So their kinetics is favorable for performing ICTAR imaging. However, Several expertise and technical requirements are needed to perform an interpret and ictal spect. First of all, we need an expert and vigilant video EEG monitoring during hospitalization of the patients. EEG reading and identification of seizure with the habitual features of the patients are also needed. 
Then a Thracian injection uh, needs to be performed within a few seconds from the onset of the seizure. And finally, it is mandatory to perform interictal spect or PET imaging to compare baseline with its aspect results by means of a dedicated software. That's why uh, a highly specialized setup with a multitask and multidisciplinary team is needed. Hypoperfusion and hypometabolism on interictal uh, imaging it is generally characterized by a larger area with respect to the seizure onset zone as uh, it is possible to visualize the dysfunctional area in close relationship to seizure onset zone which is due to different causes including neuronal loss, diaschesis, inhibitory processes and reduction in synaptic activity. It has to be uh, underlined that FDG PETs uh, is better than perfusion spect in pure interictal assets um, due to uh, its better resolution. FTG PET is useful for the identification of epidrotogenic focus in temporal lobe epilepsy and compared to video EEG and MRI as most incremental value in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy and a normal MRI scan or a bilateral temporal lobe abnormalities on MRI or a nictal EEG discordant with MRI or seizure semiology. In this slide, you can see an ictal imaging with FDG PET in a 7 years old male with temporal lobe epilepsy. FDG PET was uh, obviously originally intended to be interictal, however, EEG monitoring showed repeated abnormalities soon after the injection, and accordingly, an area of hypermetabolism was present in the medial temporal lobe, and it was paralleled by hypometabolism in the uh, lateral temporal and posterior parietal cortex due to uh, diaschesis. Localization of epileptogenic focus can be performed also in patients with extratemporal lobe epilepsy. However, detection rate of hypometabolism relevant to focus is lower with respect to temporal lobe epilepsy. And in this case, the evaluation by means of a software-based analysis is even more important. Let's review now a demonstrative case. This is an interictal FTG PET imaging in a 20 months old child with refractory epilepsy. Describe the findings. A. Apometabolism in the left parietal lobe. B. Mild hypometabolism in both medial temporal lobes. C. Hypometabolism in both the right medial and lateral parietal regions as well as in the right temporal cortex. D. Normal scan. The correct answer is C. Hypometabolism was present in both the right medial and lateral parietal regions as well as in the right lateral temporal cortex. This area of hypometabolism was corresponding to a region of cortical dysplasia on MRI in the right medial parietal lobe, and homolateral mild hypometabolism likely due to diaschesis is here also evident in both the right la um, lateral parietal cortex and lateral temporal cortex, as shown by the yellow arrows. So, let's eventually discuss the role of nuclear medicine procedures in brain tumors. From the clinical point of view, there are some issues related to brain tumors. First of all, often both malignant and non-malignant disease are characterized by the same neurological symptoms, including headache, seizure, altered mental status and focal neurological symptoms and signs. Often the same treatment can be proposed, surgery and or radiotherapy, and often malignant brain tumors originate from non-malignant precursor. Although PET and SPECT imaging has lower spatial resolution with respect to uh, computer tomography and MRI, there's an added value uh, for the evaluation in brain tumors related to 
the differential diagnosis of uh, unconclusive results for, uh, about structural brain reasons, grading and prognosis, guiding stereotactic biopsy, follow-up of low-grade uh, glioma, differential diagnosis between a residual a recurrent tumor or tumor necrosis, and the evaluation of treatment response. Several spectrum PET radiopharmaceutical can be proposed for brain tumor imaging. SPECT tracer talium and uh, 99 metastable technetium sestamibi can be used to evaluate blood flow, blood blade barrier permeability, and cellular viability. FTG PET can be proposed to assess glucose metabolism, uh, as well as uh, um, PET tracers for amino acid transporter can be used. Amino acid uptake imaging takes advantage of the low uptake in the normal brain. And, by contrast, high-grade gliomas, brain metastasis and oligodentrogliomas show intense uh, amino acid tracer uptake. False negative results may occur in case of low-grade astrocytoma, while fewer positive, uh, false positive results with respect to FDG PET are present in case of inflammation, although uptake has been reported in case of brain abscess, brain hematoma, acute ischemic stroke with reperfusion, focal cortical dysplasia. FTG PET is less accurate for the evaluation of brain tumors due to the normal uptake in cortical gray matter. However, it can provide information about the tumor grain and can have a prognostic value. In fact, FTG uptake is related to histological tumor grade and in low-grade gliomas is usually close to that one of normal white matter, while in great gliomas is similar to or even exceed uh, the uptake of normal gray matter and in glioblastoma uh, usually there's high uptake which can be inhomogeneous due to necrosis that is typical for this tumor type. Metionine can be used as an additional prognostic factor also in the selection of high and low risk patients. Let's review now a demonstrative case in brain tumors. Picture A corresponds to a flare image of a non-enhancing betalamic diffusion infiltrating lesion more prominent on the right side in a 6 years old child. For a dopa PET image and fusion PET MRI image in picture B and C show A. No uptake in the betalamic lesion B. Significant uptake in the left thalamus C. Significant uptake in the right thalamus, D, abnormal marked uptake in the basal ganglia. The correct answer is A, no uptake is present in the betalamic lesion. Biopsy revealed a grade 2 diffuse astrocytoma. In fact, pediatric low-grade diffuse astrocytoma may show absent or mild thorodopa uptake in keeping with the intrad or slow progressive behavior of these lesions. Let's review now some take-home messages of the present webinar. First of all, standardization of patent spec procedure is needed and this is actually the first step for a correct interpretation of the data in nuclear neurology. Then, qualitative visual imaging reading needs to be supported by semi-quantitative objective methods, including software and comparison with controls group. Brain PET and SPECT imaging allows identifications of disease pattern even in the preclinical stage of neurodegenerative diseases. And the eye sensitivity and the functional nature of brain PET and SPECT imaging allow identification of functional alteration in case of inconclusive structural imaging findings, such as in epilepsy or brain tumors. And I thank 